This is a talk on investigations carried out at a site in Kelty Bridge Calendar in September 2019. This project was undertaken by AOC Archaeology as part of the community-led Calendar Landscape Partnership initiative supported by the Heritage Lottery Fund. So here is the site, an arable field located just southeast of Calendar in the Trossachs in a bend of the Kelty Water or Altcar of Rick. The site is situated on a gravel terrace which forms part of the floodplain of the Kelty Water and undergoes periodical ploughing. It is 76 metres above Ordnance Datum and is bounded to the north by the A84 road. And here is an aerial photo of the site taken in 1979. This shot is shown from the south with calendar located to the left of the photo. And in this photo you can make out the crop marks that were first recorded from this, identifying the site as of potential archaeological significance. Crop marks are formed often in low-lying gravel plains due to differential growth of plants owing to water levels in the soil. Where a pit has been dug into the ground in the past, the soil will be looser, holding more water and allowing crops to grow taller. Conversely, over a stony feature such as a wall, crops will have less space and water to grow, resulting in a negative crop mark. Parch marks work in the same way, where the soil dries out to different degrees and aerial photographs taken in hot, dry conditions, such as those of the summer of 2018, can result in a boon of archaeological discoveries such as those seen here. But back to Kelty Bridge. So with this in mind, you may be able to make out the smaller and larger circular features, creating a linear arrangement of up to 20 pits or post holes. Crop marks often only show part of the picture, so it is likely that the full extent continues beyond what is seen here. The features identified were interpreted as southern and western parts of a rectilinear enclosure and transcribed by Dr Kirsty Milliken of Historic Environment Scotland, as seen here side by side with the crop mark aerial photo. And these are some similar sites with which Kelty Bridge has been identified. Balneves and Angus on the left, where you can quite clearly make out the form of an almost whole rectilinear enclosure. And Inchbare South, also in Angus on the right, which appears more curving and discontinuous with further pits or post holes located outside the main rectilinear formation. Sites like this have been interpreted as possible early Neolithic pit defined or post defined timber curses monuments. So our aims at Kelty Bridge over four days last September were to gather more evidence as to the nature of the site, that is whether it fits into this class of monument, a post or pit defined curses. We were also hoping to explore the extent of the site and compare this to the aerial photo and aerial photo transcription, locating the features more accurately through geophysical survey and test pitting and contributing to the historical environment record for the area. As part of this, the project was to be carried out by community volunteers who would be offered training in excavation, recording, survey and geophysical survey. Here you can see a group of volunteers undertaking a survey using a GPS. We excavated two two metres squared test pits over the four days of the project. These were located in advance using the aerial transcription to investigate specific features at the site. Test pit one was located to catch the edges of two possible features on the long side of the monument, while test pit two was situated to explore one of the features at the southern end. The turf was removed and volunteers worked to save the topsoil for artefacts. Some flint was found which must have been imported to the site, indicating prehistoric activity in the area. After removal of the topsoil, the volunteers worked to inspect any underlying archaeological features with careful cleaning and recording. This is test pit 2 at the southern end of the site and no archaeological features were found within it. In test pit 1 however, part of a feature was excavated. The only part of it was, in the, was within the test pit, it appeared to have a curving shape, possibly part of a larger circular feature, and it contained a reddish brown sandy silt deposit with flecks of charcoal. Within the test pit, it was at least two metres north to south and 1.2 me metres east to west and continued to the west. This has been interpreted as a large circular pit. 
a wider geophysical survey was carried out at the same time as the test pitting. This involved the use of resistivity. Resistivity is a form of geophysics where an electrical current is sent through the ground at regularly spaced intervals on a known geolocated grid. The electrical resistance of the soil varies depending on the presence of things like water content and stone concentrations and therefore is affected by archaeological features. The patterns of resistance are recorded and these are then interpreted to give an idea of potential archaeological features within the soil. Four 20 meter squared grids were surveyed around the test pits in the location of the enclosure. You can see here the darker areas of the image which represent an L-shaped high resistance anomaly, possibly a stony bank, and seven lighter coloured areas representing low resistance anomalies up to two metres in diameter. These are probably pits or possibly very large post holes. This is the interpreted image in relation to the test pits with the yellow representing low resistance anomalies. And if we look at the interpreted image with the test pits overlaid with the aerial photo transcription, we can see that there is a slight error in the record as to the exact location of the features. Based on the results of the geophysical survey, we can suggest that the features are more accurately located further to the north and east. This explains the lack of features identified in test pit two. Interestingly, test pit one was situated just on the edge of the possible stony bank and the feature in this test pit may not be one of those identified on either the geophysical results or as a crop mark. As always, these different methodologies can only offer partial insights independent of each other and should be used together to build a picture of the site as a whole. Certainly these results suggest that more remains to be discovered at Kelty Bridge. The combination of evidence from the aerial photo crop marks Geophysics and test pitting suggest that Kelty Bridge is a pit or post hole defined L shaped enclosure. Further investigation may show that the enclosure extends beyond what is seen here. But what is the enclosure? I mentioned earlier some similar sites and that this may be part of a corpus of early Neolithic structures known as timber or pit defined curses monuments. At present, we may only be seeing a fraction of a much larger site at Kelty Bridge and it may turn out that the full site has a very different form, but on the basis of the available evidence, interpretation of the site as a Neolithic timber cursus seems appropriate. So let's consider this in a bit more detail. Firstly, what do we mean when we say Neolithic? I'm sure many of you are familiar with the term, but as others may not be, I will provide a quick overview. The Neolithic in Britain is defined as the period in which farming begins. More than this, it is a whole range of new traditions, practices, materials, technologies, monuments, buildings, animals, plants and belief systems. We call this the Neolithic package. Though the exact dates and means of the arrival of the Neolithic in Britain and Scotland is debated, we can broadly say that it began sometime in the early centuries of the 4th millennium BC and was brought by incomers from the continent. This brought a whole host of changes, and we see at this time the first construction of monuments in Scotland, such as long barrows and tombs. The use of domesticated plants and animals brought about not only considerable changes to people's diets, but to how they interacted with the world around them, and with the seasons, sowing, tending and harvesting plants, caring for and moving with herds of animals through the landscape. There is also new material culture and ways of making things like leaf-shaped arrowheads, polished stone axes and the first pottery forms. Taking clay, mixing it with ground stone and placing it in a fire to create a hard watertight vessel may have seemed like magic to those who had never seen it before. Along with all these novel practices were different belief systems and we see some of these manifested in the construction of monuments at this time from earthen and timber long mounds and round mounds to megalithic chambered tombs and to the enigmatic timber curses monuments as discussed here. This was a very different way of life and a very different way of seeing the world to what came before during the Mesolithic. Thinking now about timber curses monuments, the first question we could ask is where are they found? Here's a map of known or suspected timber curses sites in Scotland with the site of Kelty Bridge added here as a red dot. 
You can see these are mainly concentrated in the lowlands of eastern and southwestern Scotland, with Kelty Bridge as a new westerly addition. And what do we know about them? Timber Cursus monuments can range in length from 50 to 500 metres and in width from 14 to 45 metres. The monument at Kelty Bridge is more than 100 metres in length and more than 15 metres wide. These structures would have been unroofed as their span is generally too wide to support a roof structure. They are overall linear arrangements but may be somewhat irregular with stretches of the monument known to curve in or out and to meet somewhat discontinuously at junctions. Let's not imagine that people of the Neolithic were incapable of building in straight lines, so this suggests that absolute linearity was either not intended or not of the utmost importance. This has also given rise to the suggestion that they may not have been built all in one phase, but added to over time, may be partially dismantled as new sections were added or continuously modified. Some of these monuments are closed at one end with a terminus and more rarely are closed at both ends. At Kelty Bridge, we have a possible terminus at the southern end. Some sites such as Milton of Guthrie in Angus, seen here on the left, also have transverse divisions, rows of pits or post holes seemingly dividing the monument into sections. But again, it is difficult to untangle the sequence of these events. Are they shorter structures that are then extended or is a division added? It is important to remember that what we are left with at these sites are essentially fragments of the original monuments. This has been amply argued by Dr. Kenneth Brophy and Dr. Kirsty Milliken, among others, emphasizing that sites like these are often underrated in both their significance and once monumental forms. If we consider timber curses for a moment, the post holes that are excavated would have once held large wooden posts. The excavated evidence suggests that these were overwhelmingly of oak and comprised substantial timbers that were cut, moved to and erected on site. This would, this would have required great numbers of people and a considerable degree of effort and social coordination. Whether the timbers were adorned or not is unknown, but they may have been elaborately carved or even painted. At a number of the excavated timber curses sites, burning has been found within the post holes. In some cases, this may be as a result of deliberate burning of the wooden structure, with evidence for subsequent post replacement at Holm and Dumfries. But in other cases, the charcoal found in post holes may represent deliberate charring of the bases of posts in order to delay in situ rotting of the timbers. In any case, it is important to remember that these sites were dynamic and shifting, changing over time. Other sites, such as Milton of Rattray, are comprised of pits that don't seem to have held posts. These pit-defined Cursus monuments were still of monumental significance and drew out similar narratives of linearity in the landscape. And many sites display a complexity of post hole and pit, pit alignments, with larger pits found adjacent to the main structure. It is difficult to tell if these were dug at a later date or form part of the overall site. Looking again at Kelty Bridge, it's possible that some of the smaller low resistance anomalies and features identified on the aerial photo represent post holes, but there are also clearly defined larger features. These may be very large post holes, but they may also represent pits. Additionally, the feature identified in test bit one seems to form part of a larger pit, suggesting further features making up the overall monument. Pits are a near ubiquitous feature in the Neolithic found across Britain, including some which predate the Cursus monuments of Cleve and Dyke and Hollywood North. And I'm sure many of you have heard of the huge shaft pits up to 10 metres in diameter and up to 5 metres in depth, recently discovered in Durrington Walls near Stonehenge. Pits were not a mundane feature in the Neolithic, but were a prominent and meaningful way of marking the land, of inscribing significance and of articulating belief systems. So when do these monuments date to within the Neolithic? Radiocarbon dates for the site at Kelty Bridge are still pending, delayed by the COVID situation, but we can consider the dates of these monuments more widely. Based on excavations, the Timber Cursus monuments, found only in Scotland, are dated to the second quarter of the 4th millennium BC, that is roughly between 3750 and 3500 Cal BC, 
or 5,500 to 5,750 years ago. This situates them not as the first monuments in Scotland, but amongst the earliest, built by the first few generations of Neolithic people. This also makes them earlier than their more well-known counterparts, ditched cursus monuments, usually known more simply as cursus. The most famous of these is probably the Dorset Cursus, stretching over 10 kilometers in length, extending across the landscape of Southern England. But they are also found in Scotland, such as the Cleveland Dyke seen here on the right, which runs for a not immodest two kilometers. As to function, many things have been suggested from Neolithic race courses, hence the name Cursus, to sites for excarnation of the dead, to pathways of ritualized movement through the landscape, there may have been multiple uses and interactions with these sites, and this is likely to have changed over the generations in which they were constructed and used. If we consider on the basis of the current evidence that the site at Kelty Bridge is part of the wider assemblage of timber curses monuments in Scotland, it is interesting to consider the site in its local context. The site in question is by no means the only evidence of early Neolithic activity in the area two polystone axes have been found in close proximity to the site. Less than one and a half kilometres to the west of the site, across the Kelty Water and the River Teeth, is the Timber Hall of Clash, excavated by Stirling and Glasgow Universities. Almost directly north of the site is the Long Cairn or Bank Barrow of Auchan Lake, while further north is another Neolithic Clyde-styled chambered cairn. The Timber Hall of Clash dated to 3,700-3,650 Cal BC, is part of a wider repertoire of timber halls found in Scotland in the early Neolithic. These may have been inhabited year-round as large houses, or they may have been seen as more centralised homes in the land, to which people returned or revisited periodically as they moved seasonally or annually through the area. One thing that can be noted is their overall linearity, and regular divisions of posts, which is clearly symbol, similar to timber curses in form, though in scale they were much smaller and likely were roofed structures. When standing, the timber hall at Clash may have looked something like this. This is a reconstructed Neolithic structure in Germany. After about 50 years or so of use, the building at Clash, as at some timber curses and other timber halls at Balbridie and Warren Field, were deliberately burnt down. Just across the road from the Kelty Bridge Timber Curses is the Long Cairn of Auchan Lake. Seen here in an aerial photo from the early 90s, it extends diagonally from the lower left to upper right in the image. This is the longest cairn in Britain at about 340 metres in length. It has a possible trapezoidal stone chamber at the south-south-east end, seen here at the top right of the photo. The overall monument has suffered from modern and historical disturbance, including a possible emptying of a lateral kist on the west side of the mound in the 1950s. So this makes it difficult to unpick the original structure. There have also been no modern investigations, yet it can be suggested on the basis of its similarity to other monuments that it was not constructed in one phase, but added to at different times. There are few monuments in Britain that can be directly compared to the Auchan Lake Cairn, except perhaps the Bank Barrow at Maiden Castle in Dorset, possibly dating to the late 36th or 35th century Cal BC, and Tom's Now, Lamb's Now in Dumfrieshire. Though not directly aligned, Auchan Lake Cairn essentially maintains the overall alignment of the Kelty Bridge Curses. This alignment leads one further north to another Neolithic chambered cairn situated on the slopes of a hill. Though likely of multiple phases, it is nonetheless likely that at least part of the cairn at Auchan Lake is contemporary with the timber hall at Clash and with the possible timber curses of Kelty Bridge. It is tempting to think of these monuments as linked and perhaps linked to movement and routeways through the landscape. The relation between bank barrows like Auchan Lake and Cursus monuments has long been suggested as prominent long linear structures of the early Neolithic, their form overwhelmingly suggests movement. At the site of Kelty Bridge, with Auchan Lake head in close proximity, 
there is great potential to investigate this relationship further, which would improve our understanding in turn of other well-known sites such as the Cleve and Dyke Curses. Again, there is clearly a relation between timber halls and timber curses in both their linear form and the use of great timber posts. And this again is something that can be explored further at Kelty Bridge. This is a unique site in which to investigate these multiple relations, providing insight into the early Neolithic of Scotland more widely. What is certain is that the area around Calendar was a vibrant place in the early Neolithic. I have no doubt that many more sites remain to be discovered and investigated in this area. This project at Kelty Bridge has allowed us to tentatively suggest that this may be the site of the Timber Curses, an important addition to a group of monuments that have only been recognised in recent years. Looking at the distribution map of these sites, we could perhaps consider it as related to those further east. At the same time, one of the polished stone axes found nearby may have been made from porcelainite, owing its origin to northeastern Ireland, demonstrating western connections to the area. More interesting again is that the possible timber curses at Kelty Bridge does not stand alone in the landscape but clearly has important connections to nearby sites. This suggests that there are more surprises waiting to be discovered in this area. To summarise, let's return to that original aerial photo from 1979. In this photo, we can see negative features, possibly pits or post holes, pertaining to a rectilinear enclosure within the field. Based on the results of this project, we have a clearer picture of this site and its wider relations. Over four days last September, volunteers carried out a joint resistivity and test pitting survey. Alongside the investigation, a local schools group visited the site and we held an artifacts workshop. An archaeological feature, probably a large pit, was discovered, excavated and recorded. This appears to be a new feature not visible on the aerial photo. The results of the resistivity have allowed us to more accurately locate the monument and suggest some differences from the aerial photo evidence, including a possible stone bank. Dating evidence pending, we can provisionally consider the enclosure as part of a wider class of timber curses monuments. These date to the early Neolithic in Scotland and are ambiguous and intriguing in their own right. As a timber curses, this suggests relations between this area of the Trossachs and eastern Scotland where similar sites are found. At the same time, the site at Kelty Bridge does not stand in isolation in its locality, but has undoubted connections both with the timber hall at Clash to the west and the complex bank barrow or long cairn of Alcan Lake to the north, not to mention other Clyde chambered cairns further north again. Polished stone axes have been found in the area with possible links to Ireland, and the flint found within the project contributes to this growing picture of Neolithic calendar and its wider context. I'd like to finish by thanking all the volunteers who participated in the project and to pose some questions for you to consider. What kind of events can we imagine took place at this site five and a half thousand years ago? How did the people who built the timber hall at Clash, the chamber cairns in the area, and the possible timber curses view the world around them? How connected were these people to wider areas of Scotland and beyond? I'm sure many, many stories are just waiting to be told about this fascinating period of Calendar's history. Thank you for listening. <laughs>